Thank you, Beth. Uh, I am so delighted to be here this evening. Um, science communication is very close to my heart. And if I do my job right, by the end of this evening, I will have transferred some of the excitement that I feel for this field onto you. And you will in turn share some of your excitement with your friends and loved ones and hopefully be inspired to continue to learn about astronomy, specifically planets, on your own. And I'll provide you with some resources to do that. But uh, first things first, we're going to start with the most important part of the presentation. First, how to pronounce my name. <laughs> I find that people really appreciate uh, a pronunciation key when they encounter my name for the first time. So it's pronounced Aomawa. Once again, Aomawa. And I thought for the first interactive part of the program, we could all say my name together. <laughs> so on the count of three, one, two, three. Aomawa. Perfect. You're all pros. Good stuff. I also wanted to give a bit about my background because as you already heard Beth talk about, it's a bit unusual compared to most of my colleagues in the astronomy community. When I was 12 years old, my seventh grade class was shown the movie Space Camp. Has anyone ever seen that movie? Yeah. How many people? Show of hands. Okay, not many, <laughs> but enough. Uh, for those who have not had the privilege, uh, the movie came out in 1986, and it's about a group of kids who are at space camp in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and they naturally get accidentally launched into space on the shuttle. This is the movie poster. Well, watching this movie was a defining moment in my life. I went from wanting to be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader when I grew up, <laughs> much to my mother's chagrin, to wanting to be an astronaut and an astronomer. And I rushed home after school and went straight to my trusty set of world book encyclopedias. And I grabbed the volume labeled A, and I read the entire entries for astronaut and astronomer. And that afternoon, uh, at the tender age of 12, I plotted out my entire career trajectory. I was going to go to the best science and technology school in the world, MIT then get my PhD in astronomy, and then after a couple of years of professional experience, apply to NASA and the Astronaut Candidate Program. Well, I stuck pretty close to that path all the way through college. I did get into and graduated from MIT, and I was kind of poised to continue my journey in astronomy, but along the way, I got really interested in theater and started to do a lot of theater and a lot of acting, and I found that I really loved it. I loved movies and TV shows, and specifically those that had a sci-fi focus. Um, I loved the ones that had to do with exploring space or the ocean, this uncharted territory. But I was conflicted. I couldn't decide if I wanted to be doing what the actors themselves were doing, or if I wanted to be doing what the actors' characters that they were portraying were actually doing. I looked around me, and I didn't see many people in the astronomy departments and community that looked very much like me. Most of them looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the opportunity to explore a different career path. I auditioned for and got into a graduate acting program at UCLA. And I left astronomy and moved out to, UC to LA and uh, got my MFA in theater from UCLA. While I lived in LA, I did a lot of incredible things. I acted in a film that went to Sundance called Nine Lives and was on Ebert and Roper's top 10 list of 2005. I uh, hosted a TV science news magazine style show for PBS called Wired Science. But I found that I missed astronomy. And so I took a job working for the Spitzer Space Telescope, which like Hubble is in space looking at the universe, but it's using different eyes to look at the universe. It's looking at the universe with infrared lenses instead of visible lenses. So it's really good at looking at heat from young stars and dust and galaxies. Well, while I was working at Caltech for Spitzer, that's Spitzer's headquarters, I went to a lot of astronomy talks. And I found that I was really interested in the talks the astronomers gave on planets, in particular planets orbiting other stars, these extrasolar planets or exoplanets for short. 
and I decided that I wanted to study exoplanets. So I applied to grad school for astronomy and got in. And after long discussions with my husband, who is also an actor who I met at UCLA, we decided to transplant ourselves from a life in Hollywood to a life in the Pacific Northwest so, <laughs> so that I could come to the University of Washington. So that gets us up to speed. But I thought it was important for you all to know that there are many paths to being a scientist, including non-traditional ones. So here's an image of our planet, Earth, taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts in 1972. Although the Earth has very, very hot regions, this is the Lut Desert in Iran where temperatures get as high as 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and there are very cold regions. This is a high ridge in the Antarctic Mountains where temperatures can drop down to minus 135 degrees Fahrenheit. By and large, the global annual average surface temperature on the Earth is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about the annual average temperature in San Francisco. So in terms of climate, Earth is a pretty pleasant place to live. And so far, it's the only place that we know of where life exists. In terms of its climate, though, it wasn't always particularly pleasant. In fact, Evidence suggests that temperatures may have been much, much colder. So cold, in fact, that ice covered the planet from pole to pole. And this extreme climate state has been termed Snowball Earth. And I first learned about Snowball Earth during my first year as a grad student here. And I was taking one of the core intro astrobiology courses. How many people know what astrobiology is? Okay, I heard life there, and that is, yes, that's it. So it's astronomy meets biology. We're all interested in life, how life started on our planet, how it's evolved, how it's continuing to evolve, and how common it might be in the universe here and elsewhere. So these Snowball Earth episodes are believed to have happened 600 million years ago, 800 million years ago, and probably about two and a half billion years ago. And as an astronomer, I was fascinated by this possibility that our planet was once completely ice covered. And I started to wonder if such a thing could happen on planets orbiting other stars, all these planets that have been found already. Because our planet orbits one single average star in a galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars in a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies. This image is the Hubble Deep Field. It's a pretty famous image in our community, and it's a mosaic of different images that were taken by a camera on Hubble. And they were taken with these long exposure times between 30 and 42 hours. And if you're a photographer, you know that that's a really long time to take an exposure. Hard but to you a <laughs> That's right, <laughs> very hard. <laughs> But we had to have that long exposure time to be able to collect the light from these distant galaxies. Some of them are 12 billion light years away. Each pinpoint of light that you're seeing here, just about, is an entire galaxy, not a star anymore. Within our own galaxy alone, we've discovered over 1,000 planets orbiting other stars. And you've probably heard in the news these large numbers or statistics that we're sort of guessing at based on what we have discovered. There might be as many as 60 million or you know, 100 million or billions of planets orbiting other stars just in our own galaxy alone. So it's a very exciting time just to be alive because we may actually still be around when we first discover that holy grail in astronomy, that Earth-like planet. I wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of red dwarf stars, because I'm going to talk to you tonight about searching for life around red dwarf stars. So when I say the word red dwarf star, does anyone want to hazard a guess or know how red dwarf stars compare to stars like our sun, for instance? They're cooler, yes. And if you've ever gone out and looked at the stars, you might notice that some of them look a little redder than others, some look yellow, some look white or blue. Well, 
there's many different types of stars, and this is a diagram showing you the types of stars that exist. Now those massive stars, O stars, are the ones that look bluish or whitish. And just like a flame that you might see or picking up a fire poker, you see the end of the fire poker, that white part, the bluish part, is much hotter than the red or yellow part. Same thing with stars. These massive O stars are much hotter than the small, cool red stars. And then I show you our sun there as well for comparison. It's often called a G star, uh, but we'll just say the sun for tonight. These massive O stars are like the James Dean of the star family. <laughs> because they're so hot, they burn their fuel fast. They burn through it fast, and they live fast, and they die young. Their lifespans are only on the order of hundreds of millions of years. Sounds like a lot, but that's actually not a long time when we're talking about how long life takes to evolve. It's thought that it took life on our planet about on the order of a billion years to develop. So if we're talking about life on a massive, on a planet orbiting a massive star, it's not really a good bet. These red dwarf stars, on the other hand, because they're cool and they're much smaller, they actually burn their fuel much slower. They are the tortoises of a star family. They conserve their fuel, burn it slowly, and so they live a long time, a long fruitful life on the order of hundreds of billions, if not trillions of years. No red dwarf stars have died yet in the age of the universe, which is believed to be about 14 and a half billion years. So because of that, we're really interested in what life might be like on those planets because it, def it definitely seems like life would have a chance to develop and evolve on a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. And it's a wonderful thing because red dwarf stars happen to be the most numerous stars in the galaxy. 75% of all stars in our galaxy are red dwarf stars. That's another plus for life because the more stars we have out there in that class, the higher the probability of finding that Earth like planet around that star. G-type stars, they're probably on the order of about 15 to 20 percent. There are very, very few of those massive, massive stars. The question for those who didn't hear the question were what's, how many G-type stars like our sun are there out there? So far less than red dwarf stars. Um, and then even fewer of those massive O stars because they live fast and die young. They just don't hang around very long. So how do we find planets around stars? Well, it'd be great if we could just go out and take a picture of the planet. And to some degree that has been done, but only for the really big planets. Um, and the simple reason is that it's just very hard to do that because the star, even those cool red dwarf stars, are much, much brighter than planets that orbit them. So trying to find a planet around a star is like trying to find a firefly when you're looking in a spotlight. The glare of the star just totally overpowers the planet. So most of the techniques we use are indirect instead of directly imaging. We're looking at how the star is affected by having a planet orbit around it. So this is a little video of one of the techniques, the Doppler technique, where we're, we're actually looking at the wobble that the star does in response to having a planet orbit around it. Both the star and the planet are doing their own little dance. They're both orbiting around a common center of mass. So that little wobble that the star exist, exhibits is something we can actually measure. And looking at how much wobble there is will tell us how massive the planet is more massive planets are going to tug on their stars more. And this actually is much more predisposed to be measured when we're talking about red dwarf stars, because red dwarf stars are smaller, so the planet of the same size is going to tug on that star more, and the wobble is easier to measure. If we look at another technique, and this has been popularized by the Kepler mission, it uses this technique, and it's just looking at how the brightness see if I can find the cursor here, how the brightness can actually dip as a star, as a planet passes in front of the star. So you can see that as a planet passes in front and behind the star, it actually takes a little bite out of the light from the star. 
and we can measure that bite, that dip. And looking at how big that dip is will tell us the size of the planet that's orbiting in front of the star. And again, this is actually much better when we're talking about red dwarf stars because they're smaller, so that chunk of light that the planet takes out of it is going to be bigger. And when we have a bigger dip in brightness, that's actually going to be easier for a telescope to measure because our telescopes are trying to catch up and be sen as sensitive as they can get to be able to detect these planets. So there's some real pluses when it comes to looking for planets and eventually looking for life around red dwarf stars. But alas, I wish it were all rainbows and unicorns for uh, planets around red dwarf stars, but it's not. And now it's time for me to talk about some possible complications. So this is a diagram of the Goldilocks zone for different stars. Now, if you might remember from childhood, Goldilocks wanted her porridge not too hot, not too cold, but just right, right? When we talk about life and what life needs, let's talk about us. What, what do you and I need to have every day or we're going to die? Okay, air, water, sun, okay, good. Water, water is something that we must have and all life, in fact, on Earth needs to have every day in order to survive. So this Goldilocks zone is the Goldilocks zone is the distance from a star that a planet has to be in order to keep liquid water, just that, liquid on the surface too close in, as you can see with that red line, and the water is just going to boil away, like water in a pot that you leave too long on the stove. Too far away, all the water will freeze. As you can see, that swath, that Goldilocks zone, is much closer in to a red dwarf star than a star like the sun, and even a much, much brighter star. That presents some problems when we talk about planets, and potentially planets that might have life. If you're so close to the star, then the star can do things to the planet. It can tug on the planet, and there might be some effects that can be detrimental for life. The star can tug so much on the planet that it essentially slows its rotation down. So stars rotate just like planets do, but they rotate much more slowly on the order of once a month. But stars and planets can actually pull on each other such that the rotation becomes locked between the two. And that's a situation that we call tidal locking. And it's where you have the planet showing one face only to its star. And that side is always in perpetual day. And the other side is in perpetual night. Just like our moon. Our moon is tidally locked to the Earth. We only see one face and there's always that dark side of the moon that you never see. Same thing can happen with planets around red dwarf stars if they're so close in the way they have to be in order to keep liquid water liquid on the surface. So I'd love for us to talk more about after the break what that might mean for life. And I'm interested to see what your questions are because it's raised a lot of concerns in our community. Could life exist on a tidally locked planet where you've got this one side that's in perpetual day and is therefore maybe pretty hot and the other side that's in perpetual night? What would the atmosphere do in that case? Could the atmosphere compensate? Some people say yes, some people say maybe not, but it actually could be a good thing too. And there's been some recent work that suggests that a tidally locked planet around, an, uh, around a red dwarf star could actually be more conducive for life and that that situation could actually help planets be even closer to their stars without having one side be boiling. And I can talk more about that after the break. Another issue that we're concerned with or concerned about when it comes to planets being really close to their stars is stellar flare activity. So our sun exhibits stellar flares and these eruptions, which we call coronal mass ejections. Um, so it happens with us, except for we have a really strong magnetic field. The Earth has a strong magnetic field, and that actually helps buffer us against those, that flare activity that comes from the sun. Well, when your planet is as close to its star as a red dwarf planet would have to be if it's in that Goldilocks zone, the flares could be extremely intense, much more so than for the sun. And 
red dwarf stars are much younger. They tend to be much younger compared to how long they live. They're those long lifespans I was talking about. Stars are much more active when they're younger. They rotate more faster. Remember I said that on the order of once a month is how often our sun rotates, once every 30 days. Well, red dwarf stars can rotate once every couple of days or every few hours. And the way they distribute their heat is different from how the sun distributes its heat. And that can uh, cause some heavy magnetic activity. And those flares could reduce the strength of a planet's magnetic field, its protection. And it could also strip away a planet's atmosphere. And without an atmosphere, our planet would certainly be much, much colder. So we think an atmosphere is an, an incredibly important thing for a planet to have, to, ha to have life on it. It might be that these, this life might have to live at the bottom of the ocean in order to escape this harmful flares and UV rays that can come from the red dwarf star. Those same UV rays that give us sunburn here can be up to 100 or 1,000 times stronger coming from a red dwarf star. So life might have to be at the bottom of the ocean uh, to escape those harmful UV rays. And lastly, this is what my research focuses on. It's looking at how ice behaves on planets orbiting different stars. On our planet, we think of ice as a very bright thing, and it reflects a lot of light back out into space. Ice, in fact, can look very different. This is a picture taken by um, a colleague of mine, Steve Warren, who's an atmospheric scientist at the University of Washington, and he goes to Antarctica um, often and measures how reflective um, different types of ice are. And this is sort of a picture of the, the extremes in reflectivity. So we've got snow there, which looks very bright. Snow is a type of ice. It's just really, really fine-grained ice. And that the blue ice that you're seeing is, is blue marine ice. And that's formed from freezing of liquid water. And there aren't in many bubbles at all in there. So it looks very dark like the ocean. Ice likes to reflect the type of light that comes from the sun, visible light. So ice on a planet that orbits a star like the sun is going to, by and large, reflect most of the light that hits it. But ice on a planet orbiting a red dwarf star loves to absorb the type of light that comes from red dwarf stars, mainly infrared light, the heat, like, like the light that our bodies actually emit, heat. Ice likes to absorb that light, and so it's going to absorb most of the light that hits it. And that might mean that ice is going to melt more easily on a planet orbiting a red dwarf star, and those snowball states I mentioned at the beginning might not be as likely on red dwarf planets. And that could be good. Maybe it's telling us that those planets have more stable climates, and life wouldn't have to contend with these extreme climatic events in order to develop. So these are some of the pros and cons that I wanted to kind of lay out for you that most of us in the exoplanet community who are interested in life around red dwarf stars are contending with and, and considering and working on. Um, it's definitely not, not, nothing is a make or break for life. Some things might seem to be more advantageous or disadvantageous, um, but this is all part of the conversation. I look forward to hearing your thoughts um, after the break. So thank you.